Imagine. Your mind is trapped in a body that has no voice. Imagine. A door slams on your hand and you can't even scream in pain. Imagine. Your entire body convulses as you fall to the ground with a seizure. Imagine if you can't even tell the person you love that you love them. That is what this boy, Vikram, faces every day of his life. He was diagnosed with autism when he was three, and he is my brother, Vicky. Now, my family and I are the only friends he has. Autism shut him out and silenced him from a world that was seemingly not designed for people like him. And you know what's ironic? Is that I've learned most of my lessons from a boy who's never spoken a word in his life ever. And if there's anything at all that I would like to do in this lifetime, I would like to take the lessons that that boy has taught me and show to you how much he has to offer to this world. But sadly, he is not alone. According to the World Health Organization, one billion people globally, that is one in every eight people, has some sort of a disability. Now, we often talk about empowering movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, the feminist movement, but there's such an important group of people that we overlook people with disabilities. In fact, they are the largest minority in this country. Helen Keller is a woman who has completely transformed our understanding of a 20th century humanitarian. She is deaf and she is blind, but she has risen to become someone today who we all venerate and adore globally. And we must remember the empathy that her caretakers and her family had for her when they would sit with her for hours teaching her English by writing letters on her hand. We must remember people like Stephen Hawking. He was a man who revolutionized our understanding of quantum mechanics and gravity. And he uses assistive technology every single day. There's something, a device that sits on his face and recognizes the movement of his muscles and helps him to speak and communicate with the world. We must remember people like Temple Grandin, who was a woman whose understanding and empathy for livestock led her to create a device called the Hug Box, which was later used to relieve people um, stress in individuals with autism. And then you have people like my brother, someone who empowered me, and he's the reason why I am standing here today. What we don't realize is the immense struggles that these people had to overcome in order to be where they are and in order to share their experiences, their struggles, and their ideas with us today. They are my real heroes because not only did they have to overcome the marginalization placed on them by society, but they had to overcome the problems placed on them by their own bodies, their own different abilities. Now, I want you to take a look at these four pictures here, and I want you to think about what all of them have in common, of course, except for my brother. Now, when I was 10 years old, my parents brought home this device, and they called it the iPad. And at that point, we had no idea of the impact it was about to have on our lives. But one day, we came back home, and this boy, who, was n who had never even been able to brush his teeth independently, had this device in his hand, and he was scrolling away intuitively, navigating through the interface, going on YouTube, selecting his favorite songs, and my parents and I were in tears. Technology was able to speak to him in a language that he could finally understand. He was able to find solace in the digital world. But what did Apple really do right? We need to look at these four metrics of accessibility. The first one, cognitive. That encompasses conditions ranging from dyslexia to autism. Number two, motor. Those encompass any sort of disability, um, disability involving a physical interaction with the screen, including uh, Parkinson's or even a broken arm. 
vision, any, it's any sort of visual problem, um, ranging from color blindness to complete blindness. And then we have hearing, from someone who um, has problems with hearing to someone who's completely deaf. Now what Apple did was they took these four metrics and they designed for the exception. All of their products take these four elements into consideration and make sure that everyone can use it. A minor addition of text field with alt tags, or just simply changing the color of your screen to allow for people with color blindness to see it. Or enabling voiceover cap so your app can be read by Apple's screen reader. Those are all minor changes that we can make here or there, but what we don't realize is by making those small changes, we're empowering entire groups of people, not just individuals, but families and entire communities. Now, over the summer, I worked with Angela Glass at Disney, and um, I worked as a designer, and one of our main missions at the company was to create an accessibility lab to test with users with disabilities. I then came back, and I realized, hey, not a lot of people at tech know not just what accessibility is, but the kind of impact that it can have. So I decided to create my own startup, and I have a website, Accessibility, and I just use that in order to show, um, showcase resources, but also information to help people understand what exactly it is and how they can get involved. But now the question is, what really is accessibility? It is giving someone who is blind the ability to know what is happening on a television. It is helping someone who can't hear to know what is happening on the other side of a phone. Accessibility leverages technology in order to transform disability into a world of possibility. By cre creating inclusive solutions ground up, no one is left behind. It's sort of this mutual understanding that we need to create products that everyone can access and so that everyone has an equal understanding that it's not meant for a certain group of people, but for everyone. It is a movement. It is a revolution. This is the Accessibility Icon Project, and they are a form of design activism that seek to change the iconography in order to create a more inclusive world for everyone. But who is responsible? Everyone. Everyone here today is responsible. We're all engineers, designers, architects, policymakers, lawyers, computer scientists, artists. We're all constantly designing at every phase of our lives. And it is so important that we consider not just when things go right, but when things could potentially go wrong. As one of the fathers of design thinking, Don Norman, best said, as soon as there is a misunderstanding, problems arise. And that is when good design is essential. So we need to consider those edge cases and enhance that human-computer interaction. And that is why I am studying in Georgia Tech I'm pursuing an interaction design, and I'm, I have an undergrad in computational media, or I'm currently pursuing it, and I'm getting my master's in digital media. And it's because I believe that design thinking is so crucial in the process. When we go out and we create companies, we create products, we develop solutions, we cannot forget the most essential part of this equation, and that is empathy. We must design with empathy. Because if we can understand the most extreme forms of inaccessibility, then we can create solutions that cater to not just someone with a disability, but that benefits everyone. This is my brother. And thanks to him, I'm here at Georgia Tech talking about this. And I just would like for everyone here to take into consideration and to remember that in the future, when you go on designing products, when you go on to create, innovate the future, I want you to remember how that little change, that minor adjustment that Apple took to think about people like him made all the difference 
and gave a voice to the invisible. It, accessibility, leveraged technology to transform disability into a world of possibility. Thank you.